Hello, I'm Tom Hartman in Washington, D.C., and here's what's coming up tonight on The Big Picture. In tonight's Conversations with Great Minds, I sit down with author and historian Neil Howe to hear his expert opinion on the fate of the generations in America and why we may be ignoring some of history's most important lessons. And in tonight's Big Picture Rumble, I'll ask the panel for their take on the week's biggest headline, the tragedy in Tucson and the key issues that have unfolded in its aftermath. And tonight, I'll have a daily take on the type of terrorism that we've all witnessed, but perhaps failed to recognize until now. For Conversations with Great Minds, I speak with an American historian, economist, and author who's opened our eyes to some fascinating insights into how generations of people interact with each other to craft the timeline of modern human history. He's written more than a dozen books, one of which, The Fourth Turning, written back in 1997, or published then, probably written before then, was prophetic in describing the events we're facing today as a nation. His most recent book is called Millennials in the Workplace. Currently, he's the president of the consulting firm Life Course Associates, senior associate for the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Global Aging Initiative. I'd like to welcome now to the studio, Neil Howe. Neil, thanks for showing up tonight. Tom, it's great, to, great to be here. Welcome to our program. Um, I, I have, uh, in, in, among my 10 or 15 most influential books is your fourth turning and the books that surround it. I think the, the whole concept of, of multi-generational well, predict I lack the words. If you could describe for us the concept, why the fourth turning? What are the four generations? What's the, what's the, the big concept right. behind What is this all about, yeah. anyway? Yeah. Uh, it really started with our, with our first book, uh, Generations, which came out in 1991, several years earlier. Uh, that's kind of what gave birth to this whole new approach. We decided, uh, this is Bill Strauss and myself, uh, we decided to write a history of America the way it, it had never been written before. And that is as a sequence of generational biographies, starting all the way back in the early 1600s with the first generation, you know, the great migration to New England with, with John Winthrop and the Puritans and so on. And we looked at each generation as a separate collective story. What were they like as children? What was going on? What shaped them coming of age? Their courtship? What wars did they serve in? How did they, how were they, uh, did they experience parenting? What were they like as midlife leaders? And what were they like in old age? How did they look back upon their lives and their life lessons? And then we'd take the next group and the next group. And, then, and what, the first thing we found that was interesting is these different generations would experience the same events, <clears throat> but they'd experience them at different ages which gave them a completely different outlook. Mm -hmm. One generation, of course, served in the war. The next generation were the children during the war <clears throat> and drew very different lessons from the experience. And Another generation were the elders during the war. They, right, the, other, yeah. the, the leaders and then the elders. And, and, the, and this kind of, these kinds of generational differences have been around for centuries. They've always been there and they've been talked about. Um, the next thing we found that was really sort of unexpected is not only are these generations all very different, but they tend to recur in a certain rhythm. That is to say, certain kinds of generations tend to follow other generations. And of course, since each generation both is shaped by history and then shapes history, right? It shapes history as midlife leaders and parents, that there is a kind of a rhythm in the kinds of generations actually implied a rhythm of history itself. And that gave rise to uh, a perspective which uh, stood at the front of our, of our, actually our third book, which was The Fourth Turning, which was instead of looking at generations and then looking at the rhythm of history, we started by looking at rhythms of history. What are the patterns of history? Why are there cycles of war? Are they cycles of religious awakening? Do, do, does drug use uh, rise or fall in any predictable pattern? 
uh, uh, is there such a thing as a long cycle, uh, a Kondratiev wave in, in economic activity? Uh, is, are there such things as a cycle of realigning elections in American history? These have been widely discussed. There's an enormous literature on looking at these kinds of rhythms and cycles. Particularly the economics. Of it. Particularly the economics. And we found that there are cycles. And in fact, the generational experience is the guiding or gother, governing um, a timer of these cycles. And it kind of gives rise, it, it gives coherence. Uh, the, the experience of being young and growing older is a constant throughout history. It really doesn't vary very much. I mean, it's true that some of us live longer than we used to, but the basic phases of life, being a young person, coming of age into adulthood, achieving leadership responsibilities, usually in your mid-40s, and then beginning to retire from public life and, and economic life in your, in your mid-60s, late-60s, these have been constants. And, and they do give a certain timing to history itself. So uh, my, my read of your book was that there are these four kind of archetypal generations that um, in that, and, and each generation is roughly 20 years. Right. Jefferson defined them as 19 years, right. let's say 20. And so every 80 years, the cycle repeats itself. Right. And each one of those four generations, because of their experience, from the generation that experiences war and depression, because of their experience, their, their, because of their children's experience growing up in that, they become the generation that does, let's, let's start with that, the, a, a generation that experiences war and depression, or depression and war. That generation is called what? Well, the, the generation... To, to pick an arbitrary point. A generation that comes of age uh, in their youth, participating actively in a period of national crisis like a war, uh, we call them a civic generation or the hero archetype. Right. And this is the founders? Th these would be the, the Republican generation, often, you know, the, the raised public generation, the original right. meaning of Republican, right. uh, of, of Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. I mean, uh, uh, precocious, young as, as political leaders, an incredible age. I think the, average, the average age of the, of the writer, authors, authors of the Federalist Papers, right, Jay, Hamilton, and Madison, something like 30 years old. That's right. I mean, imagine today. The founding document of a whole new re political regime being written by people that young. Right. But that's what we expected from that generation. So then that generation. Um, that generation then. Gives birth to. Is, is they grew old. And typical of a hero archetype, and we've seen many of them in our history, they become politically and institutionally powerful at a young age. And they occupy these positions of public leadership for a long tenure over their lifetime. They're powerful as voters. They organize. They vote frequently. They vote often, and they vote in an organized way. The most recent example of a hero archetype, of course, is the greatest generation, right? right? The GI generation, who came of age during the Great Depression, came of age in World War II. They are the most uniformed generation per capita in American history, right? Wow. Something like 15 million of them served in, in World War II. Okay. Uh, they took us out of the Great Depression. They fought these wars. They, they built the interstates and the, the, the miracle vaccines. They took us to the moon, the great society, all these wonderful civic things. They have voted, you know, our old image now of old people is they vote all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Well, old people in American history don't always vote all the time. It's Just this that generation, generation that voted. So then the civic generation gives birth to... Well, they are then followed, and this, this sometimes is their younger siblings, sometimes their children, but they are followed by what we call the artist archetype, and these are the war children. These are the children of war, born just too young, just too late to participate. We have a chart of this. In the, in the, in the war. Uh -huh. And just too early to, um, uh, 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 but early enough to actually experience the here's, crisis. Here's the turnings in history. There, there we go. And, yeah. and you can see how they're all located. Um, uh, these tend to be conformist generations young. We've seen many of them. This is the 50s in the United States. This was the 50s. This was the so-called silent generation, right. who were named by the historian William Manchester in Time magazine in the early 1950s, silent. They, um, our image of, of, of silent generation's children would be the little rascals, Shirley Temple, right. very well-behaved kids in a People tight that, envelope. People that, that Richard Nixon of, tried to reach out to politically when he, well, he, he said, did. I wanted to and, talk to the silent majority. And, 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 he, and he was uh, successful for a time, as we remember. Yeah. They, um, 
and a new generation always surprises people. Okay, that's the rule. It always comes because we're never expecting this sudden shift in youth behavior. And the silent generation surprised everyone because when they came to college right after World War II, their, their motto was no longer, we want to change the system, join the Communist Party, conquer half the world, you know, the big things the GIs want to do. Their motto was, we don't want to change the system, we want to work within the system. Right. And Fortune magazine had a cover story in 1949 called The College Class of 49, and the subtitle was Taking No Chances. Wow. Their first interviews in, in, okay, in, so, in, so, for jobs was about pension plans, right? So, so this generation, we have about four minutes here left right. until the break, and I want to, I'd like to get through all right. four of them here. So that generation, that silent generation, then gives birth to or is followed by? Is followed by the profit archetype. And of course, very recently in American history, these are boomers. We've seen this pattern again and again in American history. The generation born after the great crisis with no memory of it, indulgently raised at a time of high material affluence, they come of age triggering the next great religious or cultural awakening. This is Henry awakening. David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo exactly. Emerson, this is, and this is the hippies This is, taking, this is the hippies, this is the, this is the, the consciousness revolution. They come of age attacking the institution of their elders. They reshape not the outer world of institutions, they reshape the world of culture, values, and religion. And they spend the rest of their life as culture warriors. Right. I mean, come on, this is oh, red yeah. zone, blue right zone America. Left. This is the boomers. Yeah. And the boomers are in turn followed by the generation who are children during the awakening. These are the little kids when older people are discovering themselves and having visions of the new truth, getting in touch with themselves. These are usually, unlike the silent generation, which are overprotected, this archetype that we call the nomad archetype is underprotected. And this is Generation X. Right. We see the same pattern, and we see again and again. These are a generation of realists, and this is the survivors, free agents, and the, and this would be also the Calvin Coolidge, Warren Harding, that era. The lost gen. They were later called the lost generation. Who whose excesses, who, whose financial excesses in seeking wealth and and material prosperity, led to the Great Depression and World War II. So the cycle well, starts it, all over again. Exactly. First gave rise to the Roaring Twenties, and then to the Great. It was Generation X, along with boomers, who gave rise to the roaring 90s. Right. And then the OOs, right? And then finally, look, we have a meltdown. We have the bursting of bubbles. And we're living through the aftermath of that. Generation. And these four generations recur. And you take this all the way back to the, to the War of the Roses. To, uh, well, we, what, what we, what is take the... it back, we take it back, actually, to the, to the, to the, uh, to the Renaissance. And, and we believe it not only occurs in sort of American Anglo history, it occurs in other societies as well. In fact, we can talk about that later, but you go across the world today and you notice globally many of the same kinds of generation, generational types emerging throughout not just the English-speaking wor world, but all of Europe, including Russia, and in China. China is obsessed with generations. We should sure. talk about that because it's a fascinating and they, story. And, they're, but they're emerging at different times. Slightly than, different you know. times, but in these particular areas, there's actually a, a rough correspondence. Uh, a That's, little bit later in these other countries than in America, but a rough correspondence. It's fascinating. It's absolutely remarkable. Now, you wrote the, this book was published in 97, the fourth 1997. Term. So yes. you probably wrote this in 95, 6. We thereabouts. wrote it in 95, 96. It's a book, of course, uh, as you know, in the book we predicted. Well, that's what I wanted to read. I, I, if I'm, if just as a setup for the next All segment, because right. we've we've got about a minute here into the break, and so I, I'd like to just share this with our with our viewers, because. I remember reading this and thinking, well, we'll see. And now looking right. back on it, it blows my mind. You wrote back in 1995, the next fourth turning is due to begin shortly after the new millennium. After the year 2005, a sudden spark will catalyze a crisis mood. Remnants of the old social order will disintegrate. Political and economic trust will implode. Real hardship will beset the land with severe distress that could involve questions of class, race, nation, and empire. Yet this time of trouble will bring seeds of social rebirth, you wrote. Americans will share regret about recent mistakes and a resolute new consensus about what to do. And the very survival of the nation will feel at stake. Somewhere, sometime before the year 2025, America will pass through a great gate in history, commensurate with the American Revolution, the Civil War, the twin emergencies of the Great Depression and World War II. The risk of catastrophe will be very high. The nation could erupt into insurrection or civil, civil violence, crack up geographically, or succumb to authoritarian rule if there's a war. It is likely to be one of maximum risk and efforts, in other words, a total war. Now, this just 
is incredible. When we come back, Neil, I'd let... On the other hand, it could have a very positive, I mean, it could, yeah. it could solve all of our world problems. This is the lesson of fourth turning, so we yes. should talk. And, 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 and I want to get into that. What, you know, how did you see this coming, and what, where are we now, and where do we go? We'll be right back here with Neil Howell in our conversations with Great Minds. <laughs> Lindsay Lohan back in court. Tyler has told Rachel that these women meant nothing. People are suggesting she's a hooker. No, she says she's a porn star. Come on, fire. <laughs> to Conversations with Great Minds. I'm speaking with American historian, economist, and author Neil Howe. Neil, uh, I just, you know, before the break, read this rather lengthy, my apologies, but because I'd rather hear from you, but I thought, I, you know, it, it just, this was so prophetic. You basically said that uh, sometime after 2005, around 2005, we'd be facing this great crisis, and over the next 20 years, we would be making decisions that would literally determine the fate and future of our nation. Can you elaborate on that? Well, we, we've seen this pattern again and again in our history. I mean, every time, let's talk about that prophet archetype again, right? Yeah. Born after a great crisis, coming of age, spearheading the next awakening, redefining the culture, just like their, usually their parents redefine institutional life. Um, going into this period, what we call a third turning, which is kind of the, the 80s and 90s in America, or the, the mid-80s to sort of the mid of, of this, the OOs, right? Right. This and is this the, is a, the unraveling, you call the it. The unraveling. And this is a period where, where, insti uh, where institutions feel weak, individualism feels strong. You go into a bookstore today, and all the, all the positive books are about me, myself, and I. All the negative books are about the end of family, end of community. <laughs> right. We're all used to that today. Right. And then history tells us that this third turning ultimately issues into a fourth turning. And a fourth turning is when suddenly uh, uh, something hits, a crisis suddenly begins to emerge, and, and institutions are rebuilt ultimately from the ground up. Uh, social Literally trust reinvented. Effort, reinvented to me, in many ways. And, and, and often, uh, if there's not a crisis, a fourth turning leader might even invent one to, to galvanize collective action. For example. Uh, well, it's interesting. We just saw with Rahm Emanuel. You remember when he came in and he told, uh, he told Obama, crisis is something we shouldn't waste. Sure. You know, let's use this. Well, actually, Obama was not very successful in using that. But I think he's on to the fourth turning mood, which yeah. is basically you use a crisis. Uh, FDR did it. Lincoln did it. These are fourth turning eras. And there were 80 years apart. I mean, they there were was roughly 80, 80 years from the American the Revolution American to the Civil Revolution. War. And you go back to the Civil to War the, to the Great the Glorious Revolution. I mean, you can go back. But here's the deal. During the fourth turning, we reinvent the world institutionally. And after it's done, right, there are these different parts of a fourth turning. There's the, there's the complete evaporation of social trust. Then there's the beginning of the regeneracy, where we begin to gravitate around new institutions. And then finally, there's the climax, the great adverse circumstance, whether it's uh, a foreign enemy, whether it's economic depression, whatever it is, we surmount. And then there's finally the resolution, yeah. the signing of treaties, the building of new institutions. And in World War II, that was, you know, the Great Depression, then World War II, and then finally what ended it? It was the United Nations, the IMF, uh, it was Bretton Woods, it was the World Bank, it was all these institutions. Unlike the end of World War I, we wanted to remake the world and order the world, and we did. You know, and it lasted for a long time. You're describing Aristotle's 
a five-part story structure, you know, uh, inciting incident, progressive right. complications, crisis, climax, and resolution, then resolution. Right. And right. It's, uh, which is a little shocking. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, we reinvented the world in the right. in the light of the the Enlightenment in the 1770s by creating right. the United States. We reinvented the United States. We went from a, a weak central government to strong right. central government and flipped the role of states with the Civil War. We right. literally reinvented America. The Great Depression, Franklin Roosevelt reinvented America. Just 10 years earlier, the Lochner Court, the Supreme Court had right. ruled that child labor laws, minimum wage laws, the right to unionize were all unconstitutional. FDR literally flipped that upside down and we had roughly 80 years of post-Roosevelt, even Reagan's efforts notwithstanding right. to roll it back. Where do we go in this turning? What is this reinvention going to be? Well, what are the possibilities of it? The, the possibilities are obviously enormous. I mean, the United States plays, the United States is an empire. I mean, it plays an imperial role. I mean, we, 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 we protect the sea lanes. We adjudicate and inter, intervene in issues all over the world. I mean, the, the increasingly in, in, in official fora, the, the, everyone speaks English. You know, the English in a way is, the, is becoming the official language. And, and, and so that's why the first turning will affect the entire world. I mean, it will have obvious global implications. The, the thing I think, here's the key that people should know, is that whereas before the fourth turning starts, we can always go back and say, well, we could have predicted what set it off. In the 1920s, we could, in fact, some did predict a huge stock market crash, right? Uh, people did predict um, a, a, uh, uh, a president who would be, to some extent, anti-slavery and perhaps a certain amount of uh, secessionist sentiment within the South. Sure. But no one would have predicted, right, the destruction on the scale of the Civil War. No one would have predicted in 1925. Go back to the Scopes trial in 1925. Could anyone at that time have predicted America's role in 1945, well, looking ahead 20 that years? Matter, three years before he wrote the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson wrote, you know, the rights of uh, British American citizens. He wrote there, a booklet on how to be there a good go. citizen of Great so Britain. So here's, here's our point. Public history, public history speeds up huge changes which you think are unimaginable. Today in Washington we think, oh my gosh, it takes five years just to pass the most meager bill which all gets watered down with compromises. Under the threat of crisis, under the threat of historical urgency and sudden impending events which we feel that we cannot escape, suddenly we're impelled to act much faster, make decisions in which, in which uh, 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 you know, uh, wealth is, is, is transferred, income is transferred to the extent that it would have taken you know, decades before. That suddenly happens. History moves fast. Institutions suddenly become fluid or become malleable. This is, this is the nature of a fourth turning. And you, again, you could predict what would touch it off. You can never predict the world, I think, of the year of the late 2020s. That will be on the other side of our current fourth turning. And it could be a time of tragedy, as you were saying, total war. I often ask people, um, uh, you know, what, 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 what would we have done with a weapon of mass destruction during the Civil War if we had had it? Yeah. I think just to ask that question is to answer it. You know what, we would, what either side would have done with such a weapon. What would we have done with that during the World War II? Well, in fact, we invented our brightest scientists to invent such a weapon, and we used it. Um, I think that's the, and then you look at our next fourth turning, right? Well, we already have them. In fact, we have all different kinds of such weapons. So that's the dark side. But then there's the positive side, and that is a fourth turning is a time when we clear away all the institutional debris. We reinvent the institutions that really serve us whether it's fiscal policy, whether it's the economy, a stable economy, rebuild the middle class, protect the environment, whatever we're talking about, suddenly it works. And that's why the hero archetype that helps invent and helps create this becomes renowned for the rest of their lives. That's why they become so institutionally powerful, because later generations defer to their obvious power and their obvious skill at being able to de develop these institutions. Here was the parallel I wanted to make. Notice how, whenever we talk about politics or institutional life in America, we generally say post-war, right? Since World War II. Right. But when we're talking about the culture, we're talking about entertainment, we're talking about the interior world, we say since the 60s, right? right? And that's because the profit archetype coming of age spells ground zero for the inner world. 
the hero archetype coming of age spells out ground zero or year zero for the political and institutional world. This fourth turning is going to be resetting the clock to year zero, not on the cultural world, not on the religious world, but on the institutional and political world. And that's coming up. And we have a generation coming of age now, the millennials, who in many ways, not entirely appreciated yet, are the perfect generation for this role. That's interesting. The, it has been observed, and I didn't, perhaps I missed this in your writings, that the United States and Germany both experienced worldwide crisis in the 1930s. And one of the significant differentiators between the two was that we had FDR as president and Germany had, had Hitler as chancellor. Yeah. And had those roles been reversed, we might have actually seen history be completely different on two different continents. Is that, is there anything to that in your mind? And, and, and is the current spate of political leadership important? Uh, it is. There, there actually were people in the 1930s. Sinclair Lewis was one who actually wrote a novel about it, about yeah, the it dangers of, it can't happen. And it was yeah. about the dangers of fascism. And FDR publicly worried about Father Coughlin and Huey oh, Long. Henry I mean, Wallace was, was going off on it. So, so, so it, it did. I mean, it did. And in both societies, you had a very civic-minded, uniform-wearing uh, 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 generation, you know, coming of age. This was... Uh, here's, here's an important point to remember, and that is, it's not that history is foreordained. The events are not foreordained. Sure. Accidents of history can always happen. And people sometimes ask me that. How can history be predetermined? How do you know when there's an attack on Pearl Harbor, say? And my answer is that when you look at history carefully, you see that it's not the accident that determines history. It's our response to the accident. And that's I mean, a function of the generation. That's a that's function of in who's power. in charge and what's right. the mood of the time. The Lusitania was sunk with enormous loss of civilian lives, a kind of premeditated act of war in, 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 uh, near the end of World War I. There was the Zimmerman telegram, you know, Germans might be in cahoots with Mexico. We still couldn't get into America into war until for another year. It was an enormously controversial war, and as soon as it was over, every American soldier came home, and we vowed never to get in another war. Right. Contrast that with Pearl Harbor. Yes. The next day, we declare war almost unanimously in Congress, not only against Japan, but against Germany. It wasn't even part of it. Bam, bam. And we overnight retool America so that all those plants producing Ford, you know, you know, Model A's and all those other things were suddenly now producing tanks and Jeeps and Liberty ships and so on. That is a fourth turning mood. In other words, the mood of society prepares it to react to any spark of history in a certain way. So it's 2011. We have about three minutes yes. here. It's 2011. How close are we? How, how long will it take? What, what should we be looking for? Well, we are definitely in the, in the first stage uh, of a fourth turning, which is the evaporation of social trust. We, we see levels of dissatisfaction and distrust with all of our public institutions at Unprecedented on both sides levels. On both, on both yeah. sides. And, and the boomers are still totally into their culture wars, you know, yeah. mode. Um, the next stage will be in the face of a real crisis. This could be another meltdown of financial markets, the, the disappearance of the euro. Uh, this could be something happening in the Straits of Hormuz, get blocked. I mean, there are all kinds of accidents out there waiting China to happen. China has just announced right. to, you know, the well, scary yeah. stuff. Right. So, we, so anything can happen in the face of that begins the regeneracy. And the regeneracy is when we say, time has run out. We can't defer and delay anymore. We can't, you know, have a QE3, right? Quantitative easing three and just push our, we can't inflate our way anymore. Now it's time to bite the bullet and suddenly the quarrels stop and the hope begins to rebuild at a time which will at the time seem perilous. We're not sure we can make it. That becomes, in a way, the great swing all the way up to the climax. And that's when we reinvent the world anew. To, that's to, when to we reinvent the world anew, Neil, exactly. Neil Howe, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thank, thank, thank you for your thank brilliant, you, Thomas, brilliant work. All of your books are, are except, exceptional. The fourth turning is my favorite, but I, they're, they're all exceptional. Thank you so much. Very nice of you to say. Thank you. When we come back, it's time to debate the week's biggest stories in our Big Picture Rumble. <laughs> Lindsay Lohan back in court. Tiger has told Rachel that these women meant nothing. People are suggesting she's a hooker. No, she says she's a porn star. 
It's time for this week's Big Picture Rumble. Joining me tonight, Sarah B. Smith, Vice President of the Young Conservatives Coalition, Bill Press, host of the Bill Press Show and author of numerous books, including his, late, his latest, Toxic Talk, mm -hmm. and Ann Trenalone, am I saying that right, Ann? Yes. Trenalone, a conservative communications consultant and former member of Laura Bush's White House staff. Oh. Welcome to all of you. <laughs> Let's get started. Hey, Tom. Let me uh, just set this up. Uh, of course, this, the, the, the big story this week was the tragic shooting in Tucson over the weekend that claimed the lives of six individuals, including a federal judge and a nine-year-old girl, and left Democratic Congresswoman Gabby Giffords critically wounded with a gunshot wound to the head. Immediately after the shooting, Pima County Sheriff Clarence Dupnik said this. I think it's time as a country that we need to do a little soul searching because I think it's the vitriolic rhetoric that we hear day in and day out from uh, people in the radio business and some people in the TV business. And a few days later, Sarah Palin responded with this. But especially within hours of a tragedy unfolding, Journalists and pundits should not manufacture a blood libel that serves only to incite the very hatred and violence that they purport to condemn. That is reprehensible. There are those who blood libel? Really? So the first question, did Sarah Palin destroy her own political career by inexplicably accusing the media of committing blood libel, historically an anti-Semitic term, and the bigger picture, even though the shooter, Jared Lee Lofter's motivations are still unknown, does this tragedy shine a crucial light on our overheated political rhetoric in this country? Was Sheriff Dupnik right? So, Sarah, your thoughts on this? Um, I don't think it's her downfall. I think everyone has tried to say, oh, this is the turning point where Sarah Palin's going down and she keeps coming up. So mm -hmm. uh, she's not going anywhere. Um, secondly, I, I, I don't think you can blame a crime so directly to political rhetoric. I mean, this, this young man was clearly disturbed. I think uh, the sheriff jumped to conclusions. He actually knew this particular individual's rap sheet. So I... You know, I would say that there's no connection. I think it's silly, and I think it's an effort of the left trying to muzzle that of the right. Bill, you wrote a book on this. Uh, I wrote a book about it called Toxic Talk, which I might say was maybe published a year too soon, because I okay. think I was right on what I was trying to say. First of all, on the general question, I'd like to go back to the tragic mass shooting, the mass murder at Fort Hood. When that happened, the major who gunned down his fellow soldiers, uh, the law enforcement officials pointed out that he had been influenced by the anti-American rhetoric from an imam, uh, American, now living in Yemen, and everybody accepted that. People on the right, people on the left, everybody accepted that the words of that imam have consequences. Our words have consequences, too. Words have consequences. And to deny, uh, and by the way, you, you heard the sheriff, he didn't say people on the right or people on the left. He said all of us in public life, politicians and pundits, have to do a little soul searching about the words we use. Yeah, I think and you I think that was here in Pima County. <laughs> no, yeah, no, exactly. So. And, and, and then on, on this, on, and we'll debate that more, I'm sure. But on the Sarah Palin question, I just have to say, I think she missed uh, an incredibly important opportunity and a moment. She totally misread the moment. Uh, President Obama read it beautifully. He knew what the American people wanted here was a time of healing. And instead, she went on the air with a very self-serving video and accusing other people of blood libel. Uh, I think she hurt herself very badly. Anne, your thoughts on this? Well, if, 
if we're talking about her broadcasting career, she's doing fine because <laughs> are we not talking about her? <laughs> so right. um, I would right. question, you know, is it a political misstep? It's keeping her in the news, so and, and that's a lot of what generates from her Twitter posts and from her her things going out on the airwaves. So and, it can and, be debated. And what are your thoughts on the, the the calls now for gun control, for example? I mean, there's legislation being introduced in response to this. Um, I basically think the bigger question is looking at the mental health system and how are we looking at people who may be falling through the cracks and then looking at the community that's out there. Who's looking at your neighbors? Um, I know here in D.C., my little block and street, we're going through some tough times. There's people unemployed and it's been very interesting to see how you get involved with your neighbors and what a difference that makes in a community and how important that is. And this speaks to the fact that there are people who fall between the cracks. And it's not only the government's job to make sure people don't fall between the, the cracks, it's all of our jobs. Well, Sarah, the, you know, the, uh, Arizona, Jan Brewer rather famously last year cut mental health funding in half in Arizona. I mean, uh -huh. this kid didn't have things available to him as an unemployed person, did he? No, but he has a family and he has friends, and there have been, I mean, I feel like the media and all the pundits really jumped to conclusions rather early rather than looking at this one particular individual who had a whole history of, of uh, mental disturbances. Uh, he had even threatened to shoot a classroom once before. He was rejected by the military. You know, I think as a society, we need to be careful not to just make ourselves guilty for one person's crime. People have to take responsibilities for their own actions, too. Uh, if I may too. add, I also think as a society, we have to be careful not to crawl into a hole and just say, oh, that one Looney Tunes did that. I mean, two things. He did, he committed a political, attempted a political assassination. It was a political event at a political rally against a member of Congress in the most toxic political environment in this country. Uh, you cannot, and, and whether he, he went after her, who knows, because she was a Democrat or a former Republican, whatever reason, he hated government, and he certainly picked up that hatred of government from the environment that, that, that well, he lived in. I was in. on Fox News uh, this Tuesday morning, I think, and, and, and you know, the frame basically was hate on the right, hate on the left. You know? And uh, my question is, I, I, I think that it, we're up to eight now. Um, people from the guy who shot the, the, the guard at the Holocaust Museum, the fellow who flew his plane into the building in Texas, the guy who showed up in the Unitarian Church and killed two people and uh, wounded three others, um, uh, who had back at home uh, Glenn Beck and Sean Hannity in Michael Savage's book and said explicitly that he went there to kill Democrats, liberals, N-words and F-words. Um, the threat, you know, the guy who went to the Tides Foundation, who he's going to kill, the board of directors was having a meeting that day, over 200 bullets in the police cruiser. Where is the crazy who tried to commit mass murder who was activated by the left? Okay, well, first off, they, they, you, I think each side has extremes, and you can always do tit for tat. That's what I'm saying. On where's, the guy on, where's the guy but from the left? In this particular case, he was also burning American flags, which is not very Tea Party esque or patriotic or American. And he also was. He hated you know, government. He, right. He well, hated Mein Kampf, and, and he was reading that in the Communist Manifesto. I, well, we I think we just. Reading. He has we stated he that. He was, he was on his Facebook page. I, I think we need to seriously look at this particular individual and his case. I do think as a community, we always should recognize that we're connected and we need to, you know, have civil discourse in this country. But we can't jump to conclusions a week after a shooting like this to say this was the cause and this was the effect. No, no, no. But look, again, I guess let's not live in denial here. I mean, uh, Anne made a very good point about our mental health system. and. I, I, you ask, why didn't this guy get the help he needed? Why? How could he fall through the net? The fact is, in Arizona, there, it, there is no net. So there was no net to fall through. I mean, he was, cro I think by his, I don't, I'm not an expert, but by his actions and his acting out in class and everything, it seems to me he was crying out for help. And, and where he, were the and people it, around him? Well, where I'm sure his parents gave him there? what. I'm not going to blame his parents or his fellow students. But, I mean, the school, they didn't have anybody to refer but him they to. they know they him best. These, the government doesn't but know my, him My best. point is he did not get the help he so clearly needed. And so we're not, we're not jumping to conclusions by saying that. That's what I resent. The other thing is we're not jumping to conclusions by saying that this man, as sick as he was, should never have been able to walk into a sporting goods store and walk out with a Glock 19 the same day and pass. 
pass legally a federal background check. You don't have to be a crazy gun control nut to say something's wrong with the system. Well, right I, on, I, 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 on that, um, <laughs> a quick fire question. On Wednesday, the president and lawmakers on both sides of the aisle attended a memorial service in Tucson for the victims of the tragedy. One person conspicuously absent was Speaker of the House John Boehner, even after he was invited to accompany the president on Air Force One. Uh, apparently Obama wasn't going to make the mistake Clinton made when he sent uh, uh, Newt Gingrich to the back of the bus. Uh, instead, John Boehner stayed in Washington, D.C. to attend a fancy cocktail party hosted by the Republican National Committee. I think we have a picture here of it. Um, yeah, okay. Anyhow, so, quick fire question. Is Boehner hurting the Republican cause by being so self-involved? I don't think that's being self-involved. I think there's a lot going on right now that needs to be taken care of. Cocktail parties? There's business. I mean... I mean, he's the leader of the House of Representatives. Well, she how are we going to... There is a time to grieve, and I think it's very important that President Obama and many members of Congress and the administration went out there to the memorial service. At the same time, what kind of tribute are you paying to people's memories if you shut down the entire U.S. and don't get on with business as usual? Uh, I just have to say, he is, he is Speaker in. of the House of Representatives. She is a member of the House of Representatives. His place was in Tucson. I think so. I, but, uh, Sarah, well, you're... you know, I can't speak to what his personal calendar looked like. I think also the fact that the President of the United States was there. He is the leader of this country. and Maybe he acted as the uh, government representative to provide that healing um, and that it's speech that evening. Yeah, I think, the, the, A, the President knocked it out of the park with his speech. Mm -hmm. It was even praised by Fox News. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that John Boehner's <laughs> lack of attendance will not be remembered. Uh, it's three months from now and probably wasn't even noticed by anybody outside you're probably right. <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, time will tell. Anyhow, more Rumble after the break. Stick around. Actress Lindsay Lohan back in court. Tyler has told Rachel that these women meant nothing People are suggesting she's a hooker. No, she says she's a porn star. Back to the Rumble. Our panel of political experts tonight, Sarah B. Smith, Vice President of the Young Conservatives Coalition, Bill Press, host of The Bill Press Show, and author of numerous books, including his latest, Toxic Talk. And Ann Trenalone, a conservative communications consultant and former member of Laura Bush's White House staff. Okay, back to it. Mm -hmm. uh, on Wednesday, President Obama spoke at the Tucson Memorial in an effort to bring our country together. Take a look. I want our democracy to be as good as Christina imagined it. I want America to be as good as she imagined it. All of us, we should do everything we can do to make sure this country lives up to our children's expectations. When comparing the president's words to Sarah Palin's, there couldn't be a more striking tale of two speeches. In the big picture, do the differences between President Obama's speech and Sarah Palin's video point not only to the differing views of these two individuals, but also to the differing ideologies of the two parties? Sarah. 
You know, I actually have to say no, I really don't. I, I, I liked President Obama's speech. Um, I thought it was inspiring. I thought I was proud that he was my president in that moment, uh, even though I didn't vote for him. Um, he, he celebrated America. So you and disagree with the people on Fox today who all day long have been saying yeah, he, he was exploiting the moment, they were selling merchandise. Well, you know, oh, maybe he was doing a little bit of that, but he was also acting as the president of the United States. And I have not heard heard many speeches since his election that have inspired me or made me proud that he's our international representative and head of state. So I was happy with it and I think that Sarah Palin, Sarah Palin's reaction was um, more in self-defense but I like the points that she made and she said that even Obama and I would agree that this country, um, even if we have differences, we settle those differences at the ballot box. I've got to say, um one of the most difficult jobs for any president is at a time of crisis to, to step up and to heal and to bring a nation back together again. And President Reagan did it magnificently after the challenger. Uh, President Clinton did it after Oklahoma City. And I think President Obama uh, more than rose to the occasion um, Wednesday evening. Uh, and with, that, with the words that the nation, not just the people of Tucson, the entire nation wanted to heal. And I have to tell you, uh, I don't blame Sarah, I think Sarah Palin, as I said earlier, just missed the boat. She was totally off key. Uh, it was all about her. She had no apology, take no responsibility, just attack and accuse of blood libel. I think she missed an opportunity, but I don't blame the Republican Party for her. I don't think she speaks for the Republican Party. I think the Republican Party is bigger and better than Sarah Palin. Well, that's, that's encouraging. <laughs> and you're well, I, your earlier guest said it's not the, the tragedy, it's how you respond to the tragedy. Yes. So. See, I was listening. Um, but basically, I would say, how, why are, you're comparing apples to oranges. I would look at uh, S Speaker Boehner's statement that came out on Saturday very early. It was one of us, Excellent. all of us. Excellent. That is what I would compare well, here's, here's the president's the frame that speech I was, to. That I was trying to put this in. So is it's that putting her out there as like. The, somehow the face of the Republican Party. I don't quite agree with that. Okay. You know, Tom, okay. so, so, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd comparison. I, I want to give John Boehner credit, too. I thought his, his remarks were very brief, but they were absolutely right on mm -hmm. point Saturday morning. And I think, this, uh, coming back to Sarah Palin, she, at some point she has to prove that she's more than just a fringe candidate. Unless she's just a money-making machine. You know what, uh, right. You know what, and I, I don't, and she had an opportunity to do so. She'll have other opportunities. She certainly did not in this statement, but in the, my judgment. She's a rogue. She's playing her yeah. game the way she wants to play it, and she's keeping us all wrapped around her little finger. And that's what makes her powerful. <laughs> you know, I'm not convinced she's running for president. Huh. I'm not convinced that she's out there, just out there to make money. I think she genuinely loves this country. I think she's a true conservative. I think she's totally a Tea Party movement person and she's part of it and she wants to bring America back to the principles she believes in. I And I don't think she really cares about these political games so much. Okay. Well, well, she in, is in playing my, the biggest my, political game my of take, all. The, the big picture, my, my big picture on this is that there actually is a stark contrast between these two worldviews that Sarah Palin was reflecting the me society, the libertarian society, that if everybody is follows their own self-interest, the best public good comes out of it. And Obama was reflecting the we society, the if we're all in this together, and, and I, I, but just my take. Anyhow, last night, Rand Paul offered his demands when it comes to raising the debt ceiling, an issue that Republicans in Congress are going to have to deal with in the coming week as America maxes out its current debt limit of over $14 trillion. Take a look. Ultimately, I think the budget problem will not be fixed until we amend the Constitution and force them to balance a budget. Yeah. But in the short run, if the only thing we can get is a rule that we attach, it has to be a very, very strict rule, an ironclad rule that they cannot evade. Well, and then I'm to balance the budget from here on out would require a 44% cut in everything across the board. Military, everything. A year of campaigning against debt seems to have made an impact on the American public. According to a new Reuters poll, 71% of Americans oppose raising the debt ceiling despite dire consequences. I mean, this, this could crash the entire world economy. So how will this unfold? And why are Tea Party Republicans like Rand Paul playing chicken with the American economy? And Basically, I think that 44% just dials into the hyperbole. There's a ton of hyperbole. Everything's overblown. The 44% gets your attention. 
yeah. makes you realize that there are issues with our deficit and our budget and how we're running the country. Um, I've worked at places over the last few years and you have to cut the budget. It comes down, everybody cut 10%. And it's hard and it hurts but it's something that can be done. I've also been to business school and you don't start your negotiations where you want it to be at the end. So maybe that's just something you're saying, 44% is what it would take but what about, to make it work. What about in a business Let's, having more sales? What about raising revenue, Bill? Uh, oh, you mean <laughs> fees or taxes? I'd like to roll back the Reagan tax cuts. I, you know what I, the, the, the Reagan tax cuts. What, what this shows me is just that Rand Paul is just a total out of touch with reality. I mean, uh, the. The debt ceiling, regretfully, is going to be raised because otherwise we'll not only have a meltdown of the American economy, but the, but the global economy. And then we've got to get serious about balancing the budget. Bill Clinton did it, so Barack Obama but can do it. And why George is it Bush so odd to ask for a concession on Bill Clinton to pack cutting spending? No, he raised Bill taxes. Bill Clinton raised taxes, pardon me, he and he raised taxes. Too. He had an economic program that not one Republican voted for, and Newt Gingrich said was going to destroy the American economy, and we ended up with the eight best years of economic growth in our he modern, in modern time. He also cut spending by double digits as well. Uh, so you can't, you, uh, President Obama has increased spending by 25% of our GDP, right. okay? Yeah. So you, and, he, and his Why? new health care plan Why? is Why? $75 because billion a year. Billion. Why? We have, Why we did he? Wars go. Why did he? Because we have two wars of George Bush left, and we had, yeah. a, we had this oh, a tremendous the you know, biggest deficit and the, the biggest national is, debt. If and they're it, going to raise the debt industry, ceiling, private industry, asking for a concession and cool. negotiating that is not such a big deal. But I'm not shocked by that. Throw another, another thing in here. Uh, you know, it wasn't until Reagan dropped the top tax rate that we saw these kind of debts. I mean, we had from, from, from George Washington until Jimmy Carter, all those presidents combined on five wars borrowed less money than Ronald Reagan did in eight years. Okay, Ronald Reagan created jobs. Ronald Pardon? Reagan, yes, he did. He created 17 million new jobs in his decade. <laughs> he did. It's a fact. It's just not a fact. And he also cut the unemployment rate. He, do you know what government? Government doesn't create jobs. You're right about that. Okay, so Ronald but they Reagan create, didn't create jobs. But they create the environment in which jobs can prosper and be built. So government has to take their hands out of the private sector, which the Obama administration whoa, whoa, has showed whoa. known tendency to do. Well, so how do you how, expect? Well, how would they do that? Well, let's see. They bailed out Freddie and Fannie. They bailed out the car companies. Yeah, and where did that start? That started uh, well, under George started, W. Bush. It also under, started under we, 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 when we have to, we have to, we have to wrap it up here. I, 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 I really w. appreciate Bush. all your passion, but you know, uh, uh, just to throw my take in, if I may, at the end here. Uh, I think since 73, when Jude Wininski came out with his two Santa Claus memo and invented the phrase supply side economics and said, you know, the, the Democrats have always been the Santa Clauses of social programs. Republicans need to be the Santa Clauses of tax cuts. We've backed ourselves into this horrible situation, and we need to, we need to undo Wininski's strategy, which is what, you know, I, I would I love to debate you on that sometime, Tom. We, we will. We will, <laughs> uh, Sarah, Bill, Ann, thank you so much for being here. I, I really appreciate all of you being here. you to a concept called scatastic terrorism. It's a term that goes back to the 1930s. Essentially, it refers to the use of mass communication, such as radio or television, to encourage unstable individuals, lone wolves, to commit acts of violence. In the past, the term was often applied to Osama bin Laden's use of videotape to encourage people across the world to commit terrorism on their own, without the need to be connected to an organized group like al-Qaeda. The idea is, if you paint a picture of desperation, oppression, and war, then random people will respond accordingly, especially the unhinged. Almost always, it's the individual who commits the violence, who faces the punishment. Whereas the, st the stochastic terrorist, the person who fanned the flames, goes unpunished. So how prevalent is stochastic, stochastic terrorism in the United States? In July of 2008, a lone gunman killed two people and shot nine others at the Unitarian Church in Tennessee. He said his rampage was motivated by his hatred of Democrats, liberals, African Americans, and gays. And, poli and, people, and police found books by Sean Hannity, Bill O'Reilly, and Michael Savage in his home. 
In April of 2009, lone gunman Richard Poplowski killed three police officers, wounded two others. People report that Poplowski was a white supremacist and a birther. And evidence on his computer revealed that he was watching Glenn Beck conspiracy theories that Obama was constructing FEMA camps around the country to intern dissenters. In May of 2009, lone gunman Scott Rader killed abortion doctor George Tiller. Of course, Bill O'Reilly on dozens of different episodes spoke about George Tiller calling him Tiller the baby killer. In July of last year, lone gunman By Byron Williams attempted to murder members of the Tides Foundation, an obscure liberal organization, and members of the ACLU. He was stopped in his car before he could commence the massacre, but he put more than 200 bullets into the state police cars that stopped him, wounding two police officers. Prior to that, Glenn Beck had condemned the Tides Foundation 29 different times on his television show, claiming they were part of the liberal conspiracy. Can we really dismiss all of this violence as a coincidence, as simply the acts of deranged lone wolves? Or are we seeing here st st stochastic terrorism at work on America's airwaves? Day in and day out, Americans hear this kind of stuff in the political discourse. You have a naked Marxist American hating, white hating wing of the party about to seize power. These are actual quotes. The government is full of vampires who are trying to suck the lifeblood out of the economy. Their thirst for power and control is unquenchable, and there are only two ways for this to end. Either the, the economy becomes the walking dead, or you drive a stake through the heart of the liberals. Stake through the heart of the liberals? I'm thinking about killing him, and I'm wondering, he's speaking of Michael Moore here, and I'm wondering if I could kill him myself or if I would need to hire someone to do it. No, I think I could. I think he could be looking me in the eye, you know, and I could just be choking the life out. Another one. Body after body after body is going to be piled up at the steps of the Capitol. They're going to take these guys, and they're just going to grab them by the throat, suck their soul out of them, and then cast them aside. I believe that was in reference to health care reform. We need to execute people like that in order to physically intimidate liberals by making them realize that they can be killed too. And here this last quote. In my eyes, the charge against liberalism became a grave one the moment I discovered the liberal activities in the press, in arts, in literature, in theater. Here was a pestilence, a moral pestilence, with which the public was being infected. Every single quote you just heard has been broadcast on American airwaves, fallen on the hear ears of both sane and insane, every single quote except for one. And that quote is from Mein Kampf, written by Adolf Hitler. Can you tell me which one? Probably not. All I did was change the word Jew to liberal, and suddenly Hitler sounds right at home among the most vitriolic of conservative commentators in 2011. That's how bad things have gotten today. This is talk radio and television in Nazi Germany. Now can you see the role of catastic terrorism? People hear these quotes. They hear these guys say this stuff. Uh, the war was just beginning. The other side is attacking. There's a coup going on. These are more quotes. They're taking you out of a place to be slaughtered. They're putting a gun to America's head. The people taking these, wars, these words very seriously are not the average radio or television viewer. They're the disturbed. This is what Osama bin Laden did to activate the crazies, and in America today, the crazies are being activated. It's not too late to step back from the edge, to change the tone. This is not a call for censorship. It's a call for responsibility. And that's the big picture for tonight. For more information, you can visit our website at TomHartman.com. And don't forget that democracy begins with you. Get out there and get active. Tag, you're it. We'll see you Monday.